My name is Jackie Cabasso, and uh, I'm the executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation in California, which is a 30-plus-year-old nuclear disarmament advocacy group, as we say, working for peace and justice in a nuclear-free world. Um, I have been, we have been active with United for Peace and Justice since it was founded in 2002, and we established its Nuclear Disarmament Redefining Security Working Group right at the beginning. For the last year, um, I have served as national co-convener of UFPJ, which is functioning now on an all-volunteer basis as a network coordinated by a coordinating committee, but a very active network bringing together local groups around the country and interacting with national groups. And we are offering this workshop, which is called Uniting Our Strategies to Stop War and Save the Planet, in order to share some of the experiences that folks from different movements who we've worked with over the years have learned in order to help guide us forward together. And our first speaker is going to be Michael Clare, who's going to, yeah, it's you, <laughs> who's going to be talking about the connections between wars, militarism, climate change, and other environmental impacts. We believe that shifting society away from the path that will result in catastrophic climate change is a project that will also require fundamental change in the nature of our economy and our politics. Militarism is one significant source of global warming, and the struggle over fossil fuel resources is one of the key precipitators of military conflict. This creates a nexus between the environmental and anti-war and peace movements, a confluence of interests, and an intersection for common struggle. Michael, if you're ready to join us, yeah. um, we're really fortunate to have Michael Blair. You don't have to say more. Well, let me just say one thing that <laughs> Michael's been in big demand at the Climate Convergence, so we're really appreciative to you for joining us here. And for those who don't Michael, know Michael, he's the author of Resource Wars, Blood and Oil, and The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources. So that should tell you what you need to know about him. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> My three points very simply are that uh, climate change is going to make war more likely, increasingly likely. Secondly, that war and conflict will make the solution to climate change less and less likely. Not to mention the fact that war uh, creates climate uh, emissions of its own. And the third point I want to make is that the only way forward <coughs> for peace in the world and also addressing climate change in the world has got to be international cooperation of climate and peace activists globally. So, and, but, but that cooperation is a path forward, a hopeful path forward. So those are the three points. Let me make them as rapidly as I possibly can uh, to open up the discussion. Number one. Climate change is going to cause increasing levels of international conflict and violence. Why is that? Because the re answer to that comes out of my research on, on resource competition and resource conflict. Wars are largely caused by competition for resources and the inequitable distribution of resources. Land, water, food, energy sources, minerals. Most of the wars underway in the world today and throughout history have occurred because some groups try to plunder and seize the resources of others through violence and those who are dispossessed are robbed, are enslaved, uh, bear historical grievances that get perpetuated in time. That's, those are the causes of conflict, uh, and I'm happy to discuss that at great length if you ask me to. The point is that climate change is going to make resource competition much more intense, much more, uh, much more um, aggressive, because climate change, its biggest impact is going to be worldwide drought, heat waves, water scarcity, land 
destruction, either through tidal invasion or through desertification, forcing hundreds of millions, eventually billions of people, will not be able to support themselves in the way they have in the past, through agriculture, through local industries. Hundreds of millions of people are already at risk and their numbers will grow. And they are going to be forced to move or to compete with others for a diminishing source of resources. Water. Water is one of the biggest causes, a uh, shortage of water is one of the biggest causes of the conflicts underway now in Iraq and Syria. Drought and the rising price of food was the triggering act for the Arab Spring. This is just an indication of what we're going to see a lot more of. So climate change will be a cause of war and in internal conflicts among peoples as the supply of vital resources is diminished. Uh, and this is, this is the way climate change will affect humans, not because polar bears are dying, but because we're going to be, people are going to be forced uh, to struggle one way or the other to, to feed themselves. So, se the second, conflict will make climate change impossible to solve. And the reason I say this is that climate change is caused by the emission of mainly of, of, of greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide produced by fossil fuel use. And this is a global problem. China is the leading emitter of carbon dioxide. India is coming along fast. Russia is another major contributor. And, and the developing nations of the world who must be our allies are the biggest contribution to the growth in climate emissions. And why they have been resistant to negotiating uh, some kind of global compact to cut emissions and stop climate change. We must, to solve climate change, must be a coordinated collaborative effort at least of the United States, Russia, and China. All the other countries could do all the good in the world. Bless those Europeans, they're doing great. Bless Denmark. But if China, Russia, and the United States do not together work together to reduce emissions, we will not solve the climate problem. So the degree to which Russia, China, and the United States, and, and also Japan, and India are adversaries and become increasingly antagonistic to it, the chances of solving climate change go down, not to mention all the billions of dollars put into militarism, like the naval arms race that's now underway in Asia because the U.S. is contesting and trying to keep China from its natural rise. And this is going to make it impossible to solve the climate problem. So militarism and conflict and, and nationalism are the enemies of progress on climate change. So my final point is that if we're serious, if we're serious about stopping climate change and its worst effects, we must build an international movement. It must be a united movement, a cooperative movement of Americans. All those Chinese activists, every day there are protests in China against the pollution, against the coal, against the horrible con breathing conditions. And there's a vast movement, I can't call it a movement because it's, it's decentralized and dispersed, but hundreds of thousands of Chinese youth have ri risen up in re rebellions against local authorities on these issues. Those have to be our allies. We have to form common cause with environmentalists in China and Russia and India and Japan to force leaders around the world, meeting here and in Paris, to adopt some kind of measures, common measures, to avert climate change. And this, I think, is why this is the essence of why there is a natural and must be a convergence between the peace movement and the climate change movement. Because peace movement will not succeed if we don't address climate change, there'll be more war, and the climate movement will not succeed in the absence of peace. And that's the basis on which I think we need to move forward um, tomorrow, uh, there'll be a rally on this theme at 77th Street in Central Park West. I think many of you will be there. 
um, I, I invite you to come. And by the way, I don't think this is being publicized. Tomorrow's march is only one that's happening around the world. There are marches happening in New Delhi, in Rio de Janeiro, in Paris, Berlin, London, and other cities around the world. And we should see our role as just part of a global movement for peace and for climate justice. Thank you. So let me explain how this next section is going to work. Don't be intimidated by the large number of people you see <coughs> sitting at the table there. Um, in this session, activists from a variety of movements who have worked together in the United for Peace and Justice context will reflect on what they've learned and about the challenges and opportunities for bringing people together with very different backgrounds, with focuses on particular communities and institutional goals in the work of broader social transformation. Uh, we hope to touch on the significance and effectiveness of strategies ranging from legislative work to direct action in a moment characterized by pronounced disparities of wealth and political power. So what we're going to do is we've asked each panelist to speak for no longer than seven minutes, hopefully five minutes. Michael modeled very well <laughs> how to be succinct. And I'm going to ask the panelists to answer uh, three questions. And since they don't know what order they're speaking in, I'm going to let them know so they can be prepared. <laughs> this, is a com this is a completely random order, okay? So take no significance from the order, because you are all equals. Um, first is going to be Lisa Fithian, then Michael Eisinger, Michael McPherson, Mary Ladke, Matt Howard, and Saif Roman. Okay? So the, here are the three questions. First, I want to ask you to introduce yourself and your organization and why you got involved with UFPJ. Second, sort of the, uh, the tofu of the uh, question, what have you learned, what strategic ideas do you have going forward to build multi-issue coalitions to make large-scale social change? And the third question is what gives you hope? And after we go through and get this hopefully kind of popcorn of ideas, then we will open it up to have some interactive discussion and sharing and uh, let you know about some opportunities to continue that discussion and sharing. So I would like to ask Lisa Fithian from the Alliance of Community Trainers to go first, and I think you can do it from there. So, um, you know, my involvement in UFPJ in many ways started years back, which also informs how I do my work, which was that in the not early 1980s, I was not only working to save a river uh, on St. Lawrence River, um, I was learning about the Pledge of Resistance and what the U.S. was going to do in Central America because of the Sandinista Revolution. And fortunately, a lot of people of faith at that time had the wisdom to call for something called the Pledge of Resistance. And we saw a model of a movement back then against war that I believe is one of the most effective models. So fast forward through you know, the invasion of Grenada and Panama, and the, the first Iraq war to this or past Iraq war. I've been involved in working against war through all of them. So coming to UFPJ was an easy fit because it made sense. But when UFPJ came together, um, thanks to the work of a lot of people in New York, Leslie Kagan, Judith, a big meeting was called, and a lot of forces were brought. And so I want to quickly move to so what I think we did and what were some of the pieces that were important to that. Um, because we struggled and we evolved. And I'll be straight up. When we started, we were united for peace. And our very <laughs> first struggle was to add justice. <coughs> it's true. Um, and I know because I fought hard for that. And then we said, this has to be at a scale beyond anything. So we knew it had to be big. right? And if we were going to be big, we needed to have a way of working that was truly democratic and truly rooted in not only our analysis of what was important for change, but in our practice. And we spent an enormous amount of time really thinking through how do we build a movement and an organization or a coalition, or we never could figure out what we were, honestly, um, because we were a little bit of everything. But some of the pieces that I thought were really essential is that we were willing to use the word empire and to recognize that there was an economic system called capitalism that was driving um, both war and climate change as we know today. There's a common, common uh, I don't want to say the word enemy because that's a paradigm I don't want to be in, but the roots of these crises are the same. So we understood we had to be democratic, we had to work at scale. 
Um, we also knew that we didn't want to be just a top-down organization and that consensus was really important to us. And so we made sure that we, at the leadership level and at the level, that we had consensus as a fundamental part of our work, in addition to recognizing why we might need to vote at times. We never tried to be rigid at anything, but build the best of what would work. Um, it was important to understand that communities of color and people of color are always the most impacted, um, whether it's in this country or around the world, and that racism is another one of the major drivers of the economic system that we have. Capitalism and racism are intertwined. You can't separate them. And everything that happens today is infused by the, the racist structures that we live in. And so UFPJ also said, we may not be a, an anti-war movement that is multiracial, but there are many communities of color and people of color involved, and the leadership of this has to reflect the communities that are most impacted. And we, again, were very conscious that it had to be majority people of color and majority women, and it had to be queer people and youth involved in the leadership. I'm very proud of the work that we did because not many entities really work that consciously. <clears throat> so the other thing I'm just going to say, I'm going to go through this quickly, and somebody's giving me time, right, will interrupt me, um, that we were a coalition, a network, a grouping of people that had different visions or how we thought change came about, different theories of change, right? Um, we had anarchists, we had socialists, we had communists, we had Democrats, we had, we had everybody. It was a big tent. And so what that meant, though, is that people had different visions and ways to do it. So we, again, tried to be a multi-strategy formation. We understood there had to be inside strategies working in the congressional and the halls of Congress because change does happen there, and particularly in war, they are essentially really important, right? And we also understood that change had to be done outside the streets as well, and we needed to be able to have mass direct action as well. And so over those years, you saw your PJ embracing different strategies and tactics on the moment. When we became tight on resources is when it became more difficult to maintain multi-strategy approaches because our capacity was not able to do as much. Um, moving through really quick. How much time do I have? <coughs> Two minutes. Okay. Um, so, one of the, let me just see if I can get this out quickly. Um, I feel like the most important thing for us to think about what always gives me hope is organizing, when people organize. Because that is the only way we have to make any kind of change, whether it's inside, outside, grassroots, top, whatever it is, is the process of organizing. And I think the challenge for us in this next period is to understand our organizing can't just be about solving this problem or this issue or even building formations. It has to be a process about culture building and transformation. Because the systems we are working in, as much as we may be able to mitigate damage through them, are not sustainable for life on this planet. It is plain and simple. And one of the mottos of this gathering here, based on Naomi Klein's book, is that you know this changes everything, right? We get this changes everything. And I guess my sort of question and 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 way I'm thinking right now is that if we aren't willing to go beyond where we've gone before and to do the organizing that's needed, not just social media, um, how and if we're not willing to take bold action, how can we possibly change anything? We've been doing this for decades. We don't have a lot of time left on this planet unless we really change things in a radical way. And so really every time we come together, it's an invitation for all of us to think how we deepen this. And the last thing I'll say is that, and I know my panelists will speak to it, but the intersection of these issues, climate and war, are not the only things that are essential for us to understand. Right? The immigration issue, police brutality, the militarizations of our communities, um, uh, the decimation and ongoing genocide of the indigenous people who continue to struggle. So I really welcome a time where we have a social forum where we come together, and instead of siloing, where we come together across movements, because the same issues, the same things are affecting all of us. And so on that note, I'm a direct action girl. I hope you'll all stay, <laughs> come out to flood Wall Street on Monday, because this is the intersection of capitalism and climate. And if we do anything, we need to support and put energy in the margins. Put energy in the margins. We need the mainstream, but if we don't have the margins really taking the lead, we're going to just continue to be the same place in 20 or 50 years. But we're all going to be dead by then. So, um, so let's do the best we can to keep life, to build a really strong, vibrant community rooted in true justice, solidarity, and let's take bold action. I'll see you in the streets Sunday and Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, I
Geisinger. Thank you. Uh, it's always hard to follow Lisa because <coughs> she's got so much energy. I'm beginning to feel like I don't. Uh, <coughs> I'm national coordinator of U.S. Labor Against the War. I was one of the uh, co-founders of the organization in uh, January of 2003. In the run-up to the war, uh, we pulled together a, a meeting of a couple hundred uh, labor people and formed this organization. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because uh, it would take too much time and I want to talk politics. Um, but it is a unique organization. It is literally the only one in the world we're aware of that brings together the official labor movement and rank and file workers as individuals into a common organization that operates not just nationally but internationally. Uh, we have been one of the uh, key forces in bringing Iraqi workers to the U.S. for tours and uh, have maintained our solidarity relationships with them over the years. But I want to talk about this other stuff. Uh, the struggle to address climate change and its environmental impacts has got to be understood to be an economic struggle. It may be many other things, but it is an economic struggle for some of the reasons that Lisa referred to. Uh, we need a new definition of national security. We need to appropriate that term and give it real meaning. National security has to include environmental security, economic security, and justice, social justice. Survival and security have got to be understood as intertwined. They're interlinked. And neither of them will be possible without justice. So we get to be defined by our values and not our fears. And that's really important. Somebody in one of the other workshops said, uh, you know, young people need to have hope. I think we all need to have hope. And if we begin to talk about our values instead of our fears, we can gain hope. We can create hope. Um, we need to start a national conversation about what it's going to take to have a new cooperative just and sustainable economy. We have to understand that we will not be able to resolve the crisis of uh, climate change or militarism if we don't change the economic order. What that's going to look like, I think, is up for debate. But it's got to be indisputable that we cannot continue doing what we're doing. Aside from the, uh, the conflict that it creates, uh, we're consuming the planet or its resources in a way that is just unsustainable. We're frying our, our, ourselves in the process. By the way, the planet's going to be fine. The planet's going to be here. We'll be gone, but the planet will be here. It's going to do quite well. Uh, the transition to an environmentally sustainable world is also the transition to an economically sustainable world. And that means we've got to dismantle the military industrial complex. Now that sounds like a really awesome, uh, you know, maybe in, in some ways it's more awesome to think about that than to think about, well, can we overturn capitalism uh, when you think about what that means. Oh, Lord. Um, if we're going to make those changes, and this is where I want to bring some things together, the environmental movement has got to become an anti-war movement, and this is picking up on Michael Clare's points, and the uh, anti-war movement has got to become an environmental uh, and economic justice, uh, the anti-militarism uh, movement has got to become an environmental and economic justice. There are three threads there, and they need to be woven together to create a rope. We cannot do it with any two of them. That means we've got to deal with the livelihoods 
of the people who today are dependent on the carbon economy and the military industrial complex. <coughs> they should not become roadkill on the path to a sustainable planet. They can't be. If we don't have them with us, we won't get there. And if we tell them they've got to sacrifice their livelihoods, their jobs, their family security, in order for us to be safe and, and, uh, and secure, we're not going to get there. So from a simple self-interest point of view, and I think there are moral reasons otherwise, we've got to develop a strategy that brings them with us. And that means convincing them they need a plan B. They don't have a plan B. What they've got is military contracts and energy con consumption. That's what they've got. And if they don't have a plan B, they're not going to be able to deal with the consequences that are coming down the road. Now, you'll see on the, on the blue paper, the first three propositions there are probably superseded by events. Because I talked about the fact that the military budget is going to be cut. You better be ready to deal with it. Well, there are going to be cuts, but it's going to be cuts selectively. And some of those cuts are going to be at the root where our people make their living. It's not going to be at the places where the weapons are used. It's going to be at the place where the system is produced. <coughs> That means workers, businesses, and communities that fail to prepare to make these changes are going to be victims of it. They need Plan B. The workers and unions have to understand that this is not a fight for their jobs alone. If workers in the refineries and workers in the military industrial uh, weapons plants see this solely as fighting for their jobs, <clears throat> they're cooked. They have to understand this is fighting for social justice, which means lots of people who don't have those good jobs have got to be dealt with justly in the solution. I'm told I'm out of time. I've run out of uh, time to do all the points, but maybe we'll get to that in the Q&A. I just want to end with one factual thing. I want to recommend to you a, a, an article. It's called uh, The Invisible Casualty of War, The Environmental Destruction of U.S. Militarism by H. Patricia Hines, H-Y-N-E-S. And um, she cites a, an interesting fact. Between 2003 and 2007, the war in Iraq generated at least 141 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. More each year of that war than 139 countries release annually. If there's an argument to be made about the interconnection between the environmental struggle and the peace struggle, that fact. Enviro war is bad for the environment. Let's put it that way, right? Not just the environment of the people who are involved in the war, but the environment generally, because there are no borders. Pollution doesn't know any borders. The planet does not respect borders. And the last thing I'll say is, Mother Nature, that's last. She gets the last word. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for your passion. And I know that all of our panelists are equally passionate, but I hope you can be less wordy. <laughs> Next up, we have Michael McPherson from Veterans for Peace. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm, as she said, Michael McPherson with Veterans for Peace. I got involved with United for Peace and Justice because a former president of Veterans for Peace, David Klein, who brought me into the organization, asked me to come to a UFPJ meet. And that's why I got involved. Um, I pretty much did. Unless I really, really, really disagree with him, I pretty much did whatever he asked me to. Um, so what the second question is. Uh, what did I lose? Second question? Yeah. What have you learned? What oh, strategic Okay, ideas? so I'm just going to go through what I decide, what I plan to say. Yes. So thinking about connecting issues, especially peace and the climate, um, I have to say that while people want peace and they think peace is a good idea, 
And while I think a majority of, of U.S. citizens um, believe that climate change is an issue, I don't think people really believe peace is necessarily possible. And I don't know if they believe in whatever needs to be done to stop climate change. So why do I say that about them not believing peace is necessarily possible? Because when I walk around with my Veterans for Peace t-shirt on and people ask me, what is that? And I tell them, you know, they say, yeah, but... And then they go into all different reasons, you know, why we can't have peace. Or they'll say, yeah, it's a great idea. I'm glad you're doing that. And then they go into, but why we can't have peace. So everybody believes it's a great idea. Even people on the right that are warmongers uh, say, you know, peace is great. But, is, but what, what do we do to actually make it happen, I think, is, the, uh, is where people just either are totally confused about it or just don't even believe it's possible because we've always had wars. Um, the other thing is, if we look at communities, and let's, for example, in Chicago over the 4th of July weekend, there were 82 shootings, 82, 14 people were killed. Um, the National Office for Veterans for Peace is in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where Ferguson, Missouri is, and I'm sure everyone here has heard of Ferguson, Missouri. Um, so what do you think people were thinking about Monday morning after the 4th of July? Or what do you think people are thinking about in St. Louis right now? And um, I've been involved, like I'm an a acting coordinator for a Don't Shoot Coalition in St. Louis. So I've been very much involved in what's going on with Ferguson. So right now I'm trying to hold in, in my mind, in my heart, the fact that the U.S. is going back to war in Iraq and in, in Syria and all those things. You know, everything Veterans for Peace does. I'm here at the climate change um, discussion and working on Ferguson. So you know, maybe I'm one of the few people who is thinking about three major things right now, whereas in St. Louis, and I would say most African Americans here in the U.S., especially progressive ones, thoughtful ones, are thinking about the Fergusons that happen around the country right. and the um, forces that create those situations. Um, so when we look at, and climate change, I think, uh, movement is much more probably diverse than the peace movement. We know that the peace movement is predominantly white and older, and Veterans right. for Peace actually has, <laughs> has, has that same problem. Um, the point being, though, because it's, if we don't have that diversity, then um, people are not thinking, the average person is not thinking about what's going on in Gaza or Syria or Iraq to, to a great degree. They might some, but they're thinking about what's happening in their own communities. So when we talk about, and, and both of my, the previous um, panelists talked about bringing movements together, which is what this panel is about, it's just so incredibly important that we figure out how to do that because um, that's what's going on in people's lives. Whatever is happening in a person's life is what they're going to deal with. The intellectual thing, they'll do a little bit, but then they're going to go back to what's happening and what's important in their life. So we have to, if we want to... Uh, be successful, we must, uh, this is not a strategy, this is just the way it is, we must figure out a way to bring these things together. Now one of the things that I think is important in, for the peace movement in terms of doing that, um, and the environmental movement in different ways, is to see, not to, to make the connections, but to uncover the connections for people. We don't need to make connections, the connections are there, so we have to think about our language. We have to uncover the connections. The young men in ISIL, Hamas, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, and the militias in different places, how different are they from the Bloods and the Crips, mm -hmm. the Latin Kings? Mm -hmm. I don't think they're that much different. I think one difference is that many of those groups in the different parts of the world have been politicized in such a way that they have identified political reasons to do things <coughs> as opposed to here more economic reasons to do things. And when I say that, the politics and the economics is obviously in trying intertwined, but the Crips and the Bloods are not doing this for um, political reasons, which if they were, we might actually have an insurgency <laughs> right here in the United States, right? So, uh-oh. Um, uh, 15 seconds of regrouping. Um, <laughs> so I think we need to understand all of these in terms of a global, a global not only domestic or overseas, right, but a global failure of social, economic, and political leadership. 
and, and that these systems have to be identified domestically and, and, and around the world together to help people see this. And what it boils down to real quick is we have to have a narrative that helps people see the connections. It in fact helps us see the connections. Because human beings, all of us, regardless of how much factual you think you are, you're really a narrative-driven person. And you take facts and place them into a narrative. Everything, everything is about a narrative. We are story driven, all of us. So we need to figure out a way to have an inclusive, wide narrative that brings people together. And then we can work together and move forward together. I, I really believe that none of the movements will be able to fully manifest themselves if they're not moving forward together, or at least haltingly, like a movement moves a little bit forward and then the next one moves forward together. If that doesn't happen, they cannot, they cannot manifest themselves. And just real, I'm, I'm almost there, real quick. Um, yes, racism uh, is intertwined in capitalism, but I also want to say racism and sexism are, are, are intricately intertwined yes. in capitalism. Thank you, Michael. Yes. <laughs> um, and part of that that's very important is the creation in all these struggles is the creation of the enemy, the creation of the other. And I really appreciate you not wanting to use the term enemy because that's exactly what I'd say they, whoever they is, want, is that creation, those, those dividing lines. And I really also appreciate you talking about values because we can all have these arguments about is it capitalism, is it this or is that. But at the end of the day, whatever system you have, if the values, Dr. King talked about a revolution in values. If yeah. you don't have the values at the center of things, whatever system you have is, is going to be corrupt and, and not respect human life right. and, right. and the planet. Right. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. Military Families Speak Out, and I want to say that Mary and I have been working together on the coordinating committee for, <laughs> I guess, more than a year now, yeah. and we've this is the first time we've met. Yeah. So. Nice <laughs> meeting everybody. Yeah. Um, I did come to uh, UFPJ because they cared about war, and I want you to care about war, and I wrote something. It takes exactly five minutes, <laughs> and um, my name is Mary Lackey, and my son Ryan is an Army Infantry Officer. Ryan was deployed to Afghanistan for 13 months at the height of President Obama's surge. During his deployment, our troops experienced the highest death and injury rates of the war. I work with Military Families Speak Out, an organization of military families formed just before the Iraq War. MFSO has given military families permission to break the code of silence and to speak out against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. MFSO supports our troops, the men and women who serve selflessly. They are doing what their country has asked of them. The problem is our country is asking the wrong thing. Only our troops are asked over and over again to selflessly serve something never demanded of our politicians. <laughs> MFSO's goal is to put a human face on war. We attempt to draw the attention of the American public who so often are totally disengaged. In fact, for the vast majority of Americans, their efforts literally end with the words, thank you for your service. Without a draft, Americans have no skin in the game. Americans have checked out. That is how you get a war entering its 14th year in Afghanistan. That's how you get unending war. Once again, we hear fear mongers trying to convince us war is absolutely necessary, that we must take extreme action lest we be destroyed. This fear mongering led us into Iraq and Afghanistan with disastrous results. Are we really willing to let the fear mongers lead us into war again? Yes, ISIS is a danger in Iraq and Syria, but U.S.-led bombing is not the answer. When the U.S. takes Amen. the lead in fighting ISIS, it is seen as, continuing, as a continuing crusade against Islam. Since the airstrikes began, ISIS has tripled its recruits. ISIS is a symptom of the problems in the Middle East. Even if we could wipe them out, it would not resolve the regional issues that created ISIS. The fight against ISIS should be led by the Muslim countries in that region, waged through politics and economic development, not bombs. President Obama promises no U.S. boots on the ground, but on Tuesday we heard General Dempsey say he is open to ground troops if air airstrikes don't stop ISIS. In good conscience, how can we continually ask our troops to risk their lives, limbs, and emotional well-being for endless, futile war? And now we have another horror of war, climate change. We have always known war was detrimental to the environment. 
devastating effects on the natural habitat, poisoned water, poisoned land, and exposure to depleted uranium. But it's much worse than that. Militarism is the most oil-exhaustive activity on the planet. The, ben the Pentagon is the largest institutional user of oil and the world's worst institutional contributor to global warming. It is also immune to climate change concerns. In 1997, during the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change negotiations, the U.S. demanded and won exemption from all greenhouse gas emissions for military activities worldwide. So there's no curbing our military first policies, no matter what the cost. The human costs of war are devastating, and the environmental costs could forever change the world as we know it. Without war and a focus on diplomacy and humanitarian aid, we have the means and money to solve the root causes of so much conflict, hunger, poverty, disease, education, and protection of the environment. Jeffrey Sachs recently wrote, Pope Francis is utterly correct and compelling when he speaks of the globalization of indifference. We have lost our moral compass as a global society. The mass media, the cynicism of Murdoch and others have crowded out decency, humanity, justice, and foresight. Yet each of us wants our children and grandchildren to survive and to flourish. We each have an instinct, a moral fiber, to keep the world safe for the future and for each other. Yet we have to reinvigorate this morality to overcome immorality of greed and power that drives our societies today. And this is where United for Peace and Justice comes in. United for Peace and Justice is a network bringing together a wide variety of organizations. We need to integrate and work together to solve our problems as a whole. Yes, our problems are immense, but we have a shared agenda. Uniting together, people can always make a difference. We can find a new way forward, transforming war to peace, making what seems impossible possible. Seats? No. Oh, oh if people want to come in, they can. There's room against the wall. They can stand over here. <laughs> you get a better view. Okay, so we have two more presenters, and the next one is Matt Howard. Matt is with Iraq Veterans Against the War. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with this uh, super esteemed panel. Uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War was founded in 2004 by the first uh, wave of folks that are coming back from the invasion of Iraq. Um, we have um, a membership of about 2,000. Uh, all folks that have served after 9-11. We've got folks that served in Afghanistan, uh, that worked on drones, um, you know, kind of the, the, the whole gamut. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we've been really, uh, so part of the reason that we joined UFPJ because as uh, a bunch of these, you know, angry vets who were not exposed to activism, were very new to this, we're really welcomed with open arms by UFPJ. Um, and we're now 10 years old, so we've got, we've had a little opportunity to, to be into, uh, to be able to build in this work and, and develop some insight. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of things that we've, we've worked on that has kind of helped inform where we're at now. Um, and you know, one of those things is, uh, so I'll just say personally, um, and I think this is not dissimilar from a lot of veterans, um, you know, it's easy to have kind of a knee-jerk response politically. Um, and when I'm going over to Iraq and hearing things about blood for oil and things like that, it was very much just to be dismissive. This is kind of, you know, hippie lingo or whatever. I've come a long way since then. Um, but but what, it, what it, I think is, is useful to think about is that there is ways that there is oversimplifying some of these things and, and our involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan is more than those things, the geopolitical. Um, and I think that, but I had a crystallizing moment in Iraq in seeing a, a mortar blow up a fuel dump and 20 foot plume of flame going on for hours on end and it kind of brought home a little bit. It was a little bit of a crystallizing moment for our, um, maybe parts of the reason that we were there. Um, one of the things that we've done over the last number of years is organize around active duty bases. One in particular is Fort Hood, which is the biggest base in the country. And our work was focused on stopping the deployment of troops with trauma. 
And part of that is because this is rampant. It happens all the time. Um, doctors are saying that someone should deploy and, and they're being rubber stamped over and sent over anyway. Um, I think the big takeaway from that work, I mean, I think a lot of really great work came out of it. We have a report coming out and all the rest, but I think the big takeaway is that the Department of Defense is massively funded. Um, it's, it's probably one of the best funded organizations in the world. And that if we're going to target, um, you know, in terms of organizing, we, wanna, we should be thinking about where the money's going to. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed inside of our membership is that we have a number of folks that have worked in extractive industries. It's not uncommon for veterans to go straight into um, working for oil companies. And some of those oil companies or companies that are involved in extractive industries are also the same companies like Halliburton that have created the infrastructure and the logistics inside of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I just talked to a journalist yesterday who had been up in North Dakota where a lot of fracking is happening and she said pretty much every worker she met was a veteran of recent wars. Um, that they go into the Army Career Center and they're sent right to towns, literally to towns where there's work to be had. So I think there's, there's, there's some serious connections both in terms of labor, in terms of the companies that are involved both in creating climate change but also in, in uh, you know, uh, continuing these wars. The other thing I want to talk about real quickly is just that um, we started an initiative with a couple of uh, really powerful Iraqi organizations, groups that I know U.S. Labor Against the War has done a lot of amazing work with. Um, one's called the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, and the other is called the Federation of Workers' Council of Unions in Iraq. And we launched this on the invasion, uh, the 10th invasion of, of Iraq, uh, the anniversary um, on, in March of 2012. And the idea was that we were wanted to point our collective fingers to the U.S. government for violating our, our rights to health, to have a healthy life. Um, one of the things that had been surfaced in the work on the ground by OFI is the toxic legacy of depleted organization of women's freedom in Iraq, um, is the toxic legacy of depleted uranium. And the usage of the, those kinds of munitions are causing rapid, you know, incredible high rates of birth defects. Um, you know, this kind of, even though this work is very much in its infancy, bringing together two groups that ostensibly there's very different, there's very uh, different effects, but also some of the same effects of these wars. And also re recognizing the contradiction of uh, oppressors working with folks that have been oppressed. Um, I, but I think that one of the things that we, we notice is how powerful this work can be. We're looking at it in terms of an international legal context, but I think there's a lot more work that can be done outside of that. We're filing FOIAs currently to find out exactly where depleted uranium was used to build our case. Um, but I think that one of the things that we, we, as we are kind of strategizing and talking, is just about, and this is kind of follows into the strategic ideas, is that these industries um, really need to be hounded by frontline communities from a point of extraction to a point of consumption. So when depleted uranium is mined in New Mexico, there are communities that are working on that. And when depleted uranium is used in countries like Iraq, we need to, we need to be surfacing that and telling those stories and letting people know that that, that doesn't work. Um, and I think that, you know, so what that, you know, and obviously that is very much in this kind of international effort that we're talking about, which is not easy, it requires a lot of work and a lot of coordinating, but I think it's really necessary so that we do see the full concept of, of climate change and militarism. Um, hesitate, to, so this is the hope part, and this is a little hard for me because it's been a rough week. Um, we lost a, a really important commu community member, um, and you know, one of the things that came up, I think, inside of our community about that, um, you know, he, he uh, passed away due to his own hands, and he's, he just had spent his, his life since going to Afghanistan uh, talking about his experience and about how we need to know about um, what the effects are of these wars, both on people inside of countries and then on the people that are returning home from them. One of the things he said a lot was, it doesn't make sense to send farmers to kill farmers in Afghanistan. You could read that. We read this at the White House. It was extremely moving. We thought well, that was wonderful. That's his poem. If you want to read that in his honor, it's really quite. You want to read that in his honor? Sure, sure, sure. Please speak louder. So, uh, I'll just say it's Jacob George is, is his name. Uh, he served in Afghanistan three times. Yeah. 
Uh, the title of this is speak sure. speak the title of this is support the troops. We we just need to support the troops is what they tell me. Well, this is from a troop, so listen carefully. What we need are teachers who understand the history of this country. What we need is a decent living wage so people ain't cold and hungry. What we need is bicycle infrastructure spanning this beauteous nation. What we need are more trees and less playstations. What we need is a justice system that seeks the truth. What we need are more books and less boots. What we need is love for every woman and man from southern Louisiana to the mountains of Afghanistan. Now it's true the troops need support, the supports that come home, they need treatment and jobs and love for the soul. See, war ain't no good for the human condition. I lost a piece of who I was on every single mission. And I'm telling you, don't thank me for what I've done. Give me a big hug and let me know we're not gonna let this happen again because we support the troops and we're gonna bring these wars to an end. So, here's the whole part. The whole part is that the way our community responded to that is, something, is nothing short of beautiful. Um, people have, have uh, created this incredible support network, really thinking about people that are in rough positions and really uh, surrounding around them. And I think that ultimately this is, this is what we got, is, is the, the strengths of our community. And, and, and I think that this has really uh, you know, driven the point home to me that we have to we be continually reaching out to each other and continually building these relationships, whether that's within our community or within our organizations. Ramen, who is currently with Resist. Saf Ramen, and um, I was on the steering committee of UFPJ back in the day when I was with an organization called the Institute for Policy Studies, and I also worked with another member organization called the National Youth and Student Peace Coalition. Um, some of my fondest memories. Um, but let me start way back. In the early 1970s, both my father and mother were the first people in their families to escape the violence of colonialism in their respective countries. My mother from Pakistan and my father from Bangladesh, what was then West and East Pakistan. Most of you probably know that history, how our biggest ally in the world, or maybe second to Israel, uh, is, um, the biggest allies colonization of South Asia in the wars, violence, and eventually independence movements that followed both destroyed and brought together communities in the region. That was before I was born, but that wasn't that long ago, and it's not a unique story. And now those same communities, the poor, the farmers, most of whom are women, the fishermen and women, the indigenous people who live in lands such as the Chittagong Hill Tracks in Bangladesh, the folks that have lived by free-flowing, beautiful, and sometimes holy rivers that are now being dammed across the region are yet again um, facing unbelievable violence. And this time, it's climate violence. First, it was military colonialism, and then economic colonialism through the World Bank, IMF, and World Trade Organization, and now it's carbon colonialism. To them, the connection is clear. Militarism, capitalism, and climate chaos are not separate things. They are the same things. In some ways, the strategy should be simple and clear, I believe. Um, in other ways, it's extremely complicated and requires careful and strategic uh, work. In the words of Arendt Roy, there's no such thing as the voiceless, only the preferably unheard. And I believe the movement is actually doing a lot of what needs to be done. And that is having the preferably unheard leading it. And they are making themselves heard. There has been a renewed focus on going deep into the grassroots recently. This is the right strategy, and I believe the only strategy. Our movements must be led by communities on the front lines. And by front lines, I mean communities that are most impacted by the violence and oppressive policies um, and those communities are organizing, bravely, bravely resisting, and beautifully building new systems from the ground up in order to change things. Um, the thing is about most impacted communities, which connects to this, is that most impacted communities are impacted in multiple ways. For example, in the United States, it's no secret nor coincidence that the communities bearing the brunt of militarism are the same communities bearing the brunt of climate chaos. 
the communities that are fighting mountaintop removal in Appalachia, fighting pipelines in their backyards in the middle of the country, those fighting fracking from Colorado to Pennsylvania, those trying to shut down incinerators in, next to schools in Detroit, are the same communities being heavily recruited to fight our wars. Across the globe, it's the, almost the entire global south that is bearing the brunt in cycle of militarism and capitalism that is causing climate chaos. To indigenous communities across the globe, the connections are clear as day. The country where my father is from, Bangladesh, and where I visit every few years, is being heavily militarized and partnering with NATO now. It's also the same country that is going to see probably the worst, um, mm -hmm. you know, the most devastating effects of climate chaos. If you look around, you can see all these communities organizing and bravely putting their bodies on the line. Indigenous communities shutting down dams and pipelines and tar, tar sands extraction sites. IVAW has been doing it beautifully for over a decade now. Um, and of course, civil society in the global south are resisting and building in the most beautiful ways. For me as someone who has male privilege, class privilege, US citizen privilege, and a host of other privileges, and for others who might not be as impacted, I think really thinking about what solidarity means in acting in organizing and living out in solidarity with those communities has to be a critical point, has to be a critical part of moving forward. Um, the organization I work for is called Resist. We started in 1967 to support uh, Vietnam draft resistors and quickly became a national funder of pretty radical grassroots movements across the country. And we really try to focus in, on supporting those frontline communities. Um, but it's hard, you know, having privilege of having money. So these are the type of questions we're always asking ourselves. Um, understanding the connection to resources in wars and climate chaos, I believe, is really, really important. But there is one thing that I think ties us all together even more, and that is the idea of justice. I have complete trust that if we let frontline communities lead the way, we will win. Um, and in fact, I think it's probably the only way we will win. So, thanks. thank everybody for sharing so thoughtfully and so personally. I think that was a really powerful set of testimonies, if you will, giving us a glimpse, at least, maybe, into what the ways forward are. I am not going to try to sum it up, except to just say that some themes that kept recurring, and also in the earlier sessions today, were the importance of thinking globally. And I couldn't help but think of the Think Globally, Act Globally bumper sticker, but in a way, that's what we're talking about. The idea of relationships, solidarity, justice, being led by the, the preferably unheard. Um, we, what is our new narrative? What values need to be at the center of our movement? How do we effectively follow the money? How do we address the needs of those who currently depend on jobs that are contributing to wars and militarism and climate change? So those are just some of the threads I heard. And we want to open it up to all of us now. We have until 2 o'clock today. And there will be also another session in this room immediately following on next steps for peace and justice which George Martin has been convening the Peace and Justice Hub, uh, and who is a former national co-chair of UFPJ, will be uh, moderating. There's also another opportunity. We'd like to invite those of you who are still going to be in New York on Monday who are not going to flood Wall Street. Yeah, sorry, I forgot what she said. Uh, that's okay. Uh, that we, UFPJ is having a, a kind of a, an assembly at SEIU 1199 starting at 10 o'clock. Um, the information is in the brochures that I passed around. But uh, it's a very, it, it's an open agenda. We do want to look at strategic dis directions going forward, and we do want to talk to folks who are interested about how they can join us and get more involved in UFPJ. So that's, those are more, so the conversation doesn't end at two, that's what I'm trying to say. So I'm just I'm only going to stand here because I can see everybody. So if people want to speak, put up your hands, and I'll take a stack. Okay, I'm just gonna. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna count over here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we'll start with those. So and please stand stand up and introduce yourself. One. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Steve Kravisky. I grew up around here, and I'm active with uh, Congress of Connecticut Community Colleges, and some of my Wesleyan friends are over there. Um, I think a couple of things to add to what's been said, and thank you for all your comments. And I'd, I'd like to get IVAW to my campus. I think part of what we're up against is uh, on the domestic front with what, especially what you read in your letter, that was very good. We are seeing a massive assault on the public sector in this country and on teachers and unions in particular. And I think part of what's going on is, or what I think what Chomsky would have called the brainwashing indoctrination, that um, there are some good alternative things on the internet, but I think when that point that was made about sort of people sort of floating along, they're worrying about their own survival. The rush to war is being accompanied by this massive brainwashing and indoctrination. And part of it, too, is a lot of people had faith in Obama. I didn't think he was going to be any different because, as a lot of you beautifully said, it's the system. So how do we come that inertia and especially the idea that people get sucked into electoral politics with false hopes and that, you know, what, what Obama's done is pretty much the same thing as what Bush did, but whereas people would have been all, all over Bush, they're loath to criticize Obama. I think we have to address stuff like that if we're going to move forward. Thank you. Thanks. And I'd like to ask people to try to keep their remarks succinct. I mean, that was fine, but <laughs> just a reminder, so as many people as possible can speak. So who was number two? I think that was. Okay. My name is Elizabeth Waldron, and I'm coming from Oregon, and I really only have two questions. I don't have a statement. Number one is, is there access to that um, letter that you read on the internet? And if so, how I would oh, I the get poem? that? The poem? That was um, uh, a warrior book. That, 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 that you know what it is. Um, warrior Writers. Yeah, Warrior Writers. There's, it's a collection Warrior of letters writers. poetry. Warrior Writers is the, is the group, writers. but they put out a few books. And his name is um, Jacob. Jacob George, and it was called Support the Troops. That's the poem he wrote. Thank you. So that's number one. And number two, I was looking at Michael in the red shirt. I think I have the right Michael. Um, <laughs> 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 I could have said that, yes. Um, could you speak more on how we would speak to um, working people about possibly losing their jobs in industries that we think are harmful. Yes, we theoretically want to create jobs in good industries, but how is that going to be done? Why don't we take all the five first and then get responses. Number three. Hi, my name is Janet Gerson, and I'm from International Institute on Peace Education. I really appreciated all the that you said. My question is, what kinds of new work, or what ki new kinds of work are being generated? What projects do you know about? And you're all doing some of that, of course. Number four. Mm -hmm. My name is Chris Weiser. I'm a student of theology at Boston College. Um, and in studying theology, I particularly focused on what does the conscience mean? And I think what I learned was when we use the phrase in good conscience that Mary pointed to, um, Saif, you mentioned to communities most impacted. So thank you for from, from that learning from your work. Um, the conscience, I think, is a str strategic way to appeal to both secular worlds and religious worlds. Um, we don't have to agree exactly what it means, but as long as we use that word, just like the United Nations Declaration for Human Rights, they use that word, conscience, uh, I think it can be a, a strategic uh, word, just like the choice of empire. So thank you for using in good conscience. I think the trend is to mean those communities most impacted, because that's a, that's a way of knowing the right direction. The United States has supported Israel since the 1940s as a bastion of resistance to Arab nationalism in the region. And if you read the original literature, and my, my colleague at Boston University, Irene Genzier, is writing a book on this, you could see that, that oil was always central 
to U.S. support for Israel and continues to be so today. I could talk more about that, but probably I shouldn't use this time. Um, I, I just want to say one thing. There was a question of what, what, what we should support, and I, I'm a college teacher. I work. I, I'm in with young people all the time, and you know my feeling is to let let them take leadership on these issues. They must. Uh, we we that is those of us in my generation are not going to solve the issues we're talking about in our time. It's young younger generations that are going to have to take the leadership, and and uh, on uh, and we ask what uh, the question is what what do I see happening. And in, in my communities, the number one issue is divestment from fossil fuels. That's what has excited the students. Um, I teach at Smith, Mount Holyoke, Hampshire College, UMass, and Amherst College. On all of them, they're very strong student-led divestment campaigns. And we can follow that lead by calling for the divestment from fossil fuels in our churches, in our communities, in our pension funds, and this this is way we we can build something that's actually going to make a difference. This is going to make a difference, divestment, and I could say why. Um, I shouldn't use fill up everybody's time, but but if you ask me, I'm happy to explain why the divestment campaign, in my mind, is a student youth led movement that has a real potential for change. Thank you, Michael. There was a question for Michael Isinger about how to address the jobs problem that we've identified. At the first session of every class, I did an exercise. I asked people to tell me what they thought constitutes a good economy. And I think some of the answers you probably would predict, you know, a good job, retirement, a decent place to live, uh, some time off with my family. Uh, I don't want to have to worry about what happens when I retire. We go through the whole list. And at the end, I say, anything else? And it's usually 20, 25 students. Boards filled up, nothing, nothing else. Nobody could think of it. I said, look at that list. Nobody in the class. And my classes had veterans, my classes had Seniors, my classes had very young people uh, just out of high school. Nobody in the class ever said, we need a bigger military, more police, right? Nobody. So I think the starting point for a conversation is what's important to you and your family? What, what kind of world do you want for your children and your grandchildren? That's the starting point of a conversation. Rather than telling people what they ought to think or what's morally correct, making judgments about them by moralizing to them, what you ought to start doing is asking some questions about what they want out of life and whether what they are doing is going to contribute to that or not. And if it's not, there's nothing wrong with the fact that they have to have a job what can they do to change it? How could you imagine this factory that today produces uh, trucks in Oshkosh, you know, armored vehicles, what could it be producing alternatively that would be good for society, for the society you want your kids to grow up in? That's the way I talk about it initially. There was another question that I think was directed at all of the panelists about um, ideas for new actions and, and initiatives. So that, is that right? Or, well, if new jobs need to be created in a new society, if the way our institutions and society are organized, what initiatives are you involved in that generate alternative kinds of work? organized differently. Yeah, but well, the gentleman asked about electoral politics and, and you mentioned President Obama. Um, so I think one thing that we're going to find ourselves in a similar situation possibly with Hillary Clinton. Oh, right? Yeah, but, but the thing is, I think th there's a couple of realities that we need to be, we need to understand and it goes back to a narrative and understanding how to bring 
um, movements together. The reason that President Obama was able to find, at least in my community as a black person, um, so much support and continues to is because we have issues of racism in our country that have not been addressed appropriately. And that if we had addressed them appropriately, then he would not be able to use that as a cornerstone of his um, power. Um, same thing with Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, when Obama was running for president um, during the primary the first time, my mother was wanting to support Hillary Clinton. And my mother's, at the time, I mean, now she's 80, so her, wherever she was, 70 something then, um, because of sexism. So, my point being that is that some of these things, I talked earlier about the enemy, the creation of the other, um, that if we want to undercut some of the political power, then we have to socially deal with some of these issues and not look for the politicians to deal with them because they don't want to deal with them. That's how they create the differences and they create their power. And so an example of something we say Obama's the same as Bush, but Obama's not the same as Bush. He's the same as Bush on many things, especially the things that we deal with. But a powerful example is where he's not the same. They're sending the Justice Department to Ferguson. That would not have happened under that's right. Bush. Okay? And that's important to me. It's important that um, the Justice Department went to Newark, New Jersey. I used to live in Newark. There have been more Justice Department investigations under President Obama and Eric Holder then I don't know in how long. That's real. So if we don't want them to be able to have that kind of power and keep us separate, then we need to do something about that um, to change the, di the political dynamics within our own society. Not, not, not through the politicians, but through the work we do. So men, we need to do some work with each other if we want to do something about sexism. And white people need to do some work with each other if you want to do something about Racism. Black people aren't working on our stuff, believe me. Okay? It's the white people that are not working on their stuff. Yes. Women are working, well, not enough. Not enough. And I'm just going to say, I don't really want to hear that about some of them because you ain't done enough, whatever you've done. And we haven't done enough. I know I'm working on sexism, but I don't say some of us because I know I haven't done, I haven't done enough. Okay? Because it hasn't changed enough. Um, now, I also want to say, I forgot to say, what, what my hope is. And I took this from, uh, The Matrix is one of my favorite movies. Something that Morpheus, Morpheus said, you have to change it a little bit. Um, I stand here before you now truthfully unafraid. Why? Because I believe something you do not. And you all probably do believe it. No, I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember I'm here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that li lies behind me. I remember that for hundreds of years we fought the, these machines and we fought in our struggles for economic and social justice. I remember that for hundreds of years they have sent their armies to destroy us. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here. And that's what gives me hope. We are here. Okay.